So I'm going to go ahead and get this started. I want to welcome everyone to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. I'm Mike Staten. I'm a soybean educator with MSU Extension, and I'll be your host this morning. There's a couple of things I want to go through. First of all, please make sure you've muted yourself during the presentations. We do want to take questions, but the best way to take questions is to type them into the chat. And uh, so please do that, and we will get your questions answered. Um, in order to get your credits properly assigned to you, please sign in with your first and last name. And to do that, you click on the participant list, you find your name and hover over it, and then click more and then rename. And when you enter your name, please put all caps. That, that does help us. So again, ask questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. There will be credits assigned to this, both CCA and RUP. And Phil will talk about that at 730. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. We're really fortunate oh, you have to have one more slide, Mike. Oh, I have one more slide. Oh, yeah, and this is a very important one. Two boxes. Uh, the box on the left is really important because we really want to collect demographic data from this program uh, from you participants. It is, it's an important and mandated aspect of all Michigan State University Extension programming. This is voluntary. And the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participated in this program. A link has been shared in the chat, so we ask that you take a moment and fill out the information in the chat. And thank you very much for that. The box on the right, basically, you can't read that, but that basically just says that everything that the university and extension does is available to everyone. Now, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Manny Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh is our corn and soybean uh, cropping systems agronomist. He also works with wheat, um, but primarily today's presentation, Manny's going to focus on corn and soybean planting considerations. Manny? Thanks, Mike. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're able to join us this morning. Uh, you can see my screen. Uh, so it's been a chilly morning for a second day in, in a row here uh, after uh, we had a couple of uh, good weeks of uh, uh, decent weather uh, to get the field work started and even some planting going on. So hopefully Jeff uh, will have uh, some better news uh, for us today uh, later when he talks about uh, the, the weather updates. Uh, in my talk, I want to touch on three key topic areas. Number one is the planting time. And as you can see in this uh, title, uh, it does matter uh, in a Northern state like Michigan. And unlike some of our South, Southern counterparts, uh, and as we are dealing with a relatively short growing season, uh, right? So we have done a lot of work uh, looking at uh, implications of planting time on, on yield. And this is our figure uh, from some of our soybean work. Uh, with planting dates on x-axis, and uh, you can see relative yield on, on y-axis. And if you see our peak uh, or, uh, is around that uh, mid uh, to early uh, May time, and after that, we start losing yield at a smaller rate first, uh, about half percent per day. And then the decline gets severe, more than a percent once we get into, into June. The caveat here is that this is all done with the one management. So everything else being, being the same, just changing in planting time. So if we think about this and divide our planting season into this early, mid and late window with early being uh, pretty much starting now until that first week of May and the late being uh, going uh, well into uh, mid June and, and later, and think about if we can tweak our management based on when we are able to plant, we can maybe change the, the slope of this curve, right? Maybe we can make the slope a little bit more vertical and be able to benefit more from early planting. On the other side, uh, we can tweak uh, our management with the late season and be able to, again, minimize the, the decline there. So the goal is that how we can improve on the, on the yield potential uh, when we are able to plant early or we get delayed or how we can cut on the on our input cost, right? So with the overall goal being increased uh, profits at the, at the end of the day. So in terms of planting time, uh, field conditions are really important as, as we all know, right? And number one factor there is uh, keeping an eye on, on that soil moisture, making sure that we are not planting into too wet of a field. 
and causing uh, uh, soil compaction and uh, some, some other issues as I have listed here. And that happens when we try to, to muddy the uh, soil uh, that, that seed into, into the ground and trying to get ahead uh, of, of, uh, of the optimal planting window. And this can again also lead to uh, this non-ideal seed placement and poor seed to soil contact, which should be one of the most important goals uh, uh, at the time of planting. If we don't do this, we are not setting ourselves up for a high yield potential and that uh, will stay with us during the, the rest of the growing season. Hopefully we won't have too many issues with the soil moisture uh, going uh, into the next few weeks, uh, but again, important to, to keep an eye on. The second, uh, critical uh, point is, is soil temperature. So making sure we are not planting into soils that are too cold. The recommendations have typically been uh, waiting for around 50 degrees uh, for heat soil temperature, not air temperature, right? And then uh, a favorable forecast. So two days ago, if we were thinking about planting, that would not have been a, a good idea, right? You can see in this map, uh, and I'm sure Jeff will talk more about this, uh, that our temperatures were in the in the mid 50s uh, uh, before, uh, but recently they have dropped, and now uh, they are into mid uh, 40s or even lower 40s. The imbibition chilling chilling injury is the main concern we have when temperatures are below 50, right? Uh, especially for corn and even for, for soybean, where the, the window is even shorter, about only 24 hours or, or so. And some recent uh, research has shown that the temperatures can be even, uh, can go into mid to low 40s uh, before we start seeing that, that injury. But it's critical to make sure that we are not planting ahead of a cold front like what we are seeing now. Essentially, it will lead into slow emergence and uneven plant stand, uh, right? Uh, that is uh, even more critical in, in corn where we need that high planting density uh, and uniform stand. Otherwise, uh, they, will, they can potentially act as, uh, as a weed, uh, those late emerging plants and cause uh, yield uh, reduction. So in terms of the optimal planting window, uh, I think uh, about this as again a, a planting window and not as a, as a calendar date essentially, right? So uh, thinking about these optimal field conditions, uh, making sure we have them before uh, before we get into, into the field. End of April to mid-May, as I was showing in that figure before, uh, seems to be still the optimal time. We can try to go with those ultra early plantings, but uh, uh, for me, the, the risk probably uh, is more than, than the potential rewards we, we might see, uh, especially for a, a crop like corn. Uh, so planting in good conditions uh, is really critical as uh, we have seen in our research that once we plant in the marginal soil conditions, you can lose a yield potential more than if you are planting uh, mid into uh, even late uh, May, uh, which has shown uh, some really good uh, yields, especially if the weather turns out uh, to be better later in the, in, in the growing season, right? In terms of what to prioritize, uh, so again, uh, specific field conditions uh, probably will be an important factor uh, there. Equipment availability is another important factor. We have been doing a lot of uh, on-farm soybean early planting work. Uh, and as you can see in this figure, showing a yield difference between early and late planting from our 2020 uh, growing season, half of our fields were able to give us more than two bushel yield benefit. And we did not see a significant yield decline in any of our fields. So it seems like uh, early planting is really critical for uh, our so I've been yields here. Uh, in, case, in terms of corn, that might not, not be the case. Uh, sorry for that interruption. So again, you can see we have some good data showing that optimal uh, planting time is really critical in, in, in soybean. Uh, we have not done uh, some of the ultra early planting times and Mike talked about it a few weeks ago uh, in terms of at least using that as, a, as an opportunity to extend our planting window. So 
that was my number one point. Uh, number two uh, is the optimal maturity selection and uh, the interaction uh, it might have with the, with, the, uh, with the planting time. You probably have seen uh, this figure that, uh, that Mike has put together in terms of uh, optimal majority group selection in, in Soybean uh, for Michigan. So in Lansing area, it's about uh, majority group 2.5 and goes up and down uh, based on, on geography. But the, the data that goes into these recommendations uh, comes from uh, one planting time in the, in the middle of, of the growing season. So it might lead us to underutilization of the growing season if we are able to plant early or overutilization uh, and then get getting frosted if we are delayed. Same thing goes for corn, uh, where uh, we rely on the on the growing degree days available, right? Uh, because uh, the growth and development is pretty much driven by by the heat units. So the idea is to match uh, the growing degree days available in our area with that uh, growing degree day rating that our hybrid has, compared to maybe relying more on the on the relative maturity uh, ratings. We have done a lot of work uh, on on the soybean side. Uh, comparing these multiple majority groups, going all the way from 1.0 to 3.5, from very early uh, planted beans, end of April until uh, very uh, late in the, in, the, in the season. And these different colors here represent different yield levels. So if we look into this data, majority group 2.5, again, typical around here in Lansing area, is right in the, in the middle. And if we see in this early planting window, as you go with the late maturing variety, you see a yield benefit. We saw more than three bushel yield increase by going to a late maturing variety if we are able to plant early in the growing season. During the mid of the season, we did not see a benefit of changing maturity. So there is a opportunity to go to uh, uh, early maturing varieties there. And especially once we, if we do get, get delayed, that we can really push to early maturing beans while maintaining high yields uh, along with the high uh, test weight and low moisture content. In terms of corn, uh, we have done uh, a lot of uh, big data analysis from our corn performance trials uh, and have seen that uh, with these new genetics, a lot of early and mid maturing Variety uh, hybrids uh, yield uh, very good compared to some of the, the late maturity hybrids. Unless we are again able to push into early into the planting season, as you can see in this figure, that with this seventh May of planting early in the, in the season, using a late maturing hybrid was able to give us yield increase. But that did not happen uh, during that mid to late planting window. And it did result in an increase in moisture content. So if we push to that um, late maturing full season hybrids, we are not seeing a yield benefit while uh, dealing uh, with high moisture content. So in terms of economic profit profitability, uh, we might be at a, at a low, uh, low loss there. One another important aspect to keep in mind uh, uh, with terms of hybrid maturity selection is this idea about growing degree of compression. Uh, essentially a delay or a less number of uh, heat units needed with delayed planting. And without going into too many details today, uh, we have seen that this phenomena does happen not until silking time, but after silking time. And the number we are seeing is about five growing degree days per day decline. Uh, with the, especially with the late maturing hybrids. So you are hybrids with a rating of 100 uh, or, or longer. So something to, to keep in mind as we make uh, our hybrid selections. And this tool uh, that we have talked about before, U2U, is, uh, is a very important tool where you can plug uh, different management aspects, uh, including that GDD rating, uh, and be able to have an idea where when that uh, black layer occurrence uh, will uh, will happen so uh, an important tool in a in a in a kit the third and final point uh, and probably the most important uh, i want to discuss is the seeding rate because it plays a role in uh, overall profitability right and as you can see in this figure this is how a soybean seeding rate response looks like based on a lot of recent research that once we are above that critical level of 50000 uh, plants per acre there is a, a, a plateau and uh, the, the plants are able to uh, 
again branch out as as you can see in in this picture uh, with some of these lower plant stands and be able to compensate so again in a very very important uh, growth response to to keep in in mind this data shows a lot of our work that we have done over the last 3 years comparing agronomic uh, versus economic optimal seeding rates so as you can see, I'm showing the agronomic optimal, which is maximizing your yield potential. And the rate goes higher with the delay in, in planting as, as one would expect. However, when we look at the economic optima, so in, including your seed cost price, you can see those numbers are much lower than agronomic optima. And we were using cash price from 2018 and 19. But even when I use the, the future November prices for this year, you can see these uh, economic optima numbers are still much lower than the agronomic optima. There's a 30 to 40K difference uh, there, especially until that early June. You can see with the late June, this is where uh, it, it does benefit to increase uh, seeding rate. So something to keep, keep in mind. Uh, the last point on the seeding rate uh, for corn, as you can see in a couple of these uh, images, uh, the yield uh, environment of a given field drives that uh, phenomena. And for the most part in Michigan, we are in this medium to high or very high yield environment. So going from 150 to 180 to more than 200 bushels. And you can see the, how the response curves looks in all of these yield environments, much different than uh, what I showed you on the, on the soybean side, right? So again, how uh, we have seen an increase uh, uh, in yield with the increase in seeding rate in that high yield environment and optima being 32 to 34,000 plants per, per acre. And if there are yield limiting factors going at, at a lower rate, but again, driven by your yield environment of a specific field. Keep in mind the target plant stand uh, versus the seeding rate factor in there, which is a smaller number compared to what we see in, uh, in, in terms of uh, soybeans. So again, coming back to those three key uh, take home points, optimal planting time is critical uh, for us in Michigan to get to that early crop establishment that can help uh, with uh, essentially putting more number of seeds per unit area and uh, even extending our seed fill window. But we need to make sure that uh, we do not plant in marginal soil conditions as that can reduce yield more than, than the late planting itself. And uh, as I, I showed you with, the, with our data that uh, adjusting those management practices uh, based on, on the time of planting uh, is a viable option. Uh, it needs uh, uh, a very well uh, planned uh, uh, aspects ahead of uh, our growing season, right? So something to keep in mind now as we are thinking about when we can get into some of our, our fields. Uh, in terms of maturity selection, again, diversity is important. Uh, so taking this portfolio approach is important. Accounting for planting time, uh, growing degree day compression, as I talked about, and even our uh, local drying capacity, right? And it also gives us a diversity in genetics that, that we are able to put on our, on our fields. And lastly, and probably more uh, importantly, that there is a potential for lowering soybean seeding rates. Uh, a lot of research we have done, other uh, universities have done, does allude to that. Uh, and uh, even the, the, if the stands get lower, replanting, uh, we really need to be thinking about that. Instead of replanting, uh, interplanting uh, really low stands below 50,000 might be, be the way to go in terms of uh, soybeans. Uh, and with that, uh, I will stop here. Uh, here is a link to our uh, website agronomy.msu.edu where you can go and find a lot more information that we have uh, on all of this research. Back to you, Mike, uh, and I think we are out of time so we can come back to, to questions towards the end. Um, I do have a, there is some questions in the chat and I would encourage uh, participants to please utilize the chat and uh, enter more questions, not only for Jeff and Manny, but also any production question that you might have, as we might have other specialists that have joined us. So any uh, field crop question is really fair game to ask at this point. And even if we don't have a specialist with us, we will forward your question onto that specialist that it pertains to and get you an answer. So 
encourage you to ask your questions. A great opportunity. So I'm going to start with one that uh, came from Mark. This is for Manny. Um, says uh, Mark says Manny, I've heard that soybeans add nodes when soybean when planted early, which may lead to increased pod number and seeds per plant. Sometimes early planted soybeans emerge at similar times as later planted soybeans. This makes me think that soybeans can sense germination timing, not emergence timing, as the beginning of their life. Do you agree with that, Manny? That's a, that's a good uh, question and comment, Mark. I, I would say, so benefit of early planting is, as, uh, a, a, as you mentioned, that uh, we, can, a, we can put more nodes, right? Typically, soybean plant will put an extra node every three and a half days. So if you plant a week ahead, you can have two extra nodes, I believe is the, is the number. But if the plants don't emerge as, as Mark is talking about, and we have seen that with our early planted uh, beans, they have sat in ground for up to 25 days before they, they would emerge. Uh, I don't know if they can sense. I don't think I have seen any data on that. But again, uh, we have data on number of nodes and number of seeds from early versus uh, uh, mid and late planting conditions. And there is a, a trend there that even though the, they, the plants didn't emerge for up to three to four weeks that they were able to put more number of uh, nodes and, uh, and pots. So I probably would agree with you that there is a, a physiological mechanism going on in there. And especially what we have seen is that if you pair that early planting with the late maturing variety, that's where you, you get the the most buck uh, essentially that you are able to extend your vegetative uh, window so you're not flowering too early so you're able to put more nodes and then you have a, a longer seed fill duration so you're able to put more number of pots essentially more number of seeds per unit area and then uh, you spend more time filling those so you end up with the same seed weight but a higher number of seeds and that's what's getting you to a higher yield potential with these early planted uh, soybeans. I, there was another question in the chat and this came from Eric and Eric's question was when should we be scouting for freeze injury in wheat and alfalfa? Hmm. I can talk maybe a little bit about wheat uh, and if Dennis is there maybe I think he can chime in. I think the temperatures went down to uh, at least uh, in, the, in the lower Michigan uh, to mid to low 20s. And I think based on our experience from that frost event we had last year in early May, I don't expect, uh, I think, too wide of a, in, uh, a plant injury at, at this point. I think we are probably getting into fixed growth stage six here, where the growing point is just about uh, to be uh, above ground, if not already. So. I would say we need to give it at least three to five days, uh, uh, but uh, for the most part, I think we probably are are okay. Dennis, are you on? Yeah, yeah, I would concur. I don't think we had cold enough temperatures to do significant damage either, um, but you can't go out there and look today and see damage from frost. Um, you gotta wait five to seven days, I would say, probably to really see it um, if you have it. Uh, I did extensive scouting last year after we had the cold temperatures and and uh, really didn't find a lot. You move further south out of the state of Michigan, um, down into Ohio and Kentucky, and if they have freeze at this time of year, it's a lot more significant because they're a lot farther along in the growth stage. Yeah. Um, and that head is more developed and it's further up above the soil surface. So um, there you can have a lot more chance of significant damage, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not real worried just yet. So, Mike, I will uh, address the alfalfa question. In the past, I've seen alfalfa damage, uh, significant damage, but it doesn't show up just like for wheat three to, until three to five days later on. So it's, it's really worth it to wait a few days and then go out and scout and look at the alfalfa. And, of course, that all depends on where the growth is on the alfalfa as far as the stage of growth. Uh, we have plants in the southern part of the state at a foot tall, and those growing points are at the top of the plant. And of course, if they're uh, significantly damaged, then the plant has to start sending new shoots up from the, the crown itself, which will pull nutrients and cause some, some delay as far as 
uh, evenness of the plants. And also uh, you're going to have that dead stuff in there, which can cause a little bit of havoc. But as you go further north, some of the plants are just beginning to break dormancy as you get into the upper part of Michigan. And they have a, a better propensity to withstand the freezing temperatures than the alfalfa that's a foot tall. So it depends on a couple of things, the growth that's there and also uh, just how cold it really got. And you check that in a few days and it'll tell you what's gonna happen. Good, good information. Thank you very much. Manny, I think probably you and I should probably talk about uh, the other crops, maybe corn and soybeans. Uh, so yeah. if you would talk about corn, maybe that would be, that'd be helpful. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah, regarding corn and soybean, again, with corn, uh, as we were talking about wheat and, uh, and alfalfa, growth stage matters, right? Uh, and the growing point for corn stays below ground until late in the, in the season. V5 to V6, uh, so five to six leaves uh, with a with leaf collar is when the growing point will emerge above ground. And I, I mean, we are, we are way too early to, to, to see that happen. So uh, I, if there was any emerged corn, uh, you might see again some leaf burns, but, uh, but that is not, 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 not a worry. The worry is if, uh, if you had some uh, planted uh, in, in this window 24 to 48 hour before the cold snap is, is when you might see that imbibition chilling injury, right? And that's where scouting is, is going to be important. And that even plant stand is really critical for, for a high corn yield. So that's where we need to be paying close attention uh, in, in terms of corn. And so I mean, so you can talk maybe more Mike, but yeah, again, uh, the, the growing point comes out of uh, ground right at emergence, right? Initially, it's protected by those cotyledons, uh, but, but once those cotyledons are open, then, then the growing point is exposed uh, to, to these low temperatures. And even if it gets killed, uh, you can have those uh, uh, two auxiliary birds uh, that, that will produce two, two shoots uh, and, and you, you, you might be okay. But again, scouting uh, is going to be more critical for, for soybean fields that uh, were already emerged. Uh, Good. Nope, I agree with that. And uh, um, there is one thing that Emerson Knopfinger said in an article from Illinois. He said that actually, when the when the beans are just cooked, uh, the hooking and cooking out of the ground, that arch, that hypocotyl arch, is very vulnerable to freeze yep. damage. And that's a really bad stage. So check your fields and see what stage they were in when this occurred. Even though you may not see damage yet. At least it'll give you an idea to know what stage they were in when the when the freeze event happened. Yeah. So, um, so what about the seeds that were many that were planted, let's say a week ago or so, um, but just laying below the soil surface? Uh, do you think uh, everything I've read that says that those soybean seeds should be should be safe? Um, yeah, I yeah merge? I I agree. I think that's the best case scenario in all of this. I think the worst case is uh, if the planting happened uh, within that 24 to 48 hour window, right? The, the, the imbibition injury can, can, can be severe. The number two, I think, uh, is uh, if the plants were already emerged or if they were in that crook stage, uh, as you were talking about. And I think the number three sort of the best case scenario here is if they were planted uh, at least uh, three days ahead of this uh, uh, event and still sitting in, in, in ground and they have imbibed water. That is the, 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 the critical phase and, and, and I believe they, they, they are okay. And uh, probably the, again, sort of a best case scenario uh, right now. And even I think even if we see, even with some of these emerged plants, if we see some injury again, as I showed in our seeding rate response data, be careful about that the replanting the season, right? And, until we have a, a severe loss uh, in, in, in stand, uh, we can go in and gap fill. So replanting, we, we still need to be, be careful about. We are still relatively early. So the replant can still be early planting, but typically a replant is a mid to, to late planting and you can lose more yield potential that way compared to uh, dealing with the, with, the, with the stand you have and maybe spending more money with the weed control and, and other, other issues that, 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 that might come. Good, good comments. Uh, there is a, I thought it was a comment, but it's actually a question. I do see the question mark. It's rule of thumb, and this comes from C. Morris. Rule of thumb is that five to 10 degrees in soil temperature loss 
from high overnight. I guess that's for you, Jeff. Is that a is that a a a, a good rule of thumb that we are going to lose five to ten degrees in soil temperature or it fluctuates? I guess uh, between the high during the day and the low at night. Well, it, it's, it's probably in the ballpark. It's, it, it depends, of course, on a number of factors. But one of them is how much water, how, how wet is the soil, and then the color of the soil also is a residue still. Uh, those all those act, the, the leftover crop residue from the previous year is more reflective, and we get a little bit less of the, the solar heating of the ground. So the color, it has a huge influence, and, but the big one is, is the moisture. The more moisture that we have in that soil, the longer it's going to take to heat up. And we've all seen examples of that and vice versa. If it's dry, it's going to, it'll really respond quickly to, to the solar heating. So it, a lot of it depends on that soil type and, and the conditions at the time. But it's, it, that's probably, probably not too far away, especially this time of the year. We'll see wider swings later on uh, as we get the solar, of course, radiation increases as we get into the middle of the summer. But right now, it's, uh, that, that five degrees is probably not a bad uh, ballpark figure. Okay. All right. So Mike and Manny, I, I have producers that are anxious <laughs> is the word I'll use to get started today. We didn't have the moisture and precipitation and they have uh, good soil conditions. Should they plant soybeans today? I would say, yeah, watch out for, for the soil temperature, right? I think Jeff showed some, some data. We are dipping into low 40s uh, right now, right? So I think that is something uh, to, be, to be careful about. Uh, maybe after noon today, uh, if, the, if the temperatures yeah. are back into uh, low to mid 40s, uh, at least mid 40s, I think, yeah, again, sometime waiting is good but yeah then then if you can't go back then 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 you you have to be be thinking about that so i think yeah after uh, lunch today probably might might be a, a good, good good spot to, to so to what going. would be the temperature that you would be comfortable with for them to go ahead and plant because i don't think that we're going to see a 10 degree swing in the in the soil temperatures today uh, just personally yeah. because it's it's pretty cold out there right now and I'll throw that to Jeff too. We could see it, it, it. Some of it depends on how many clouds. If we do get the sun, we, we will respond and we probably will pop it up. Uh, I think as Manny mentioned, we'll go back up above 50. Uh, but, uh, and tomorrow should be a, a good day. So uh, again, it looks we're we've probably hit the bottom of this longer term slide downward in terms of our soil temperatures and they'll be headed back up here later today and certainly then continuing into the, the weekend and, and especially then early or the, that next week with that warm spell. But uh, if we get sun, I, I would be, I would expect to see the, certainly the two inch values uh, go back up above 50 this afternoon, but really important. Uh, I think uh, Mike, as you mentioned, you want to go out there, make sure you take some of your own data if you can, mm -hmm. look what, what, yeah. what's actually going on out there. And I would say we can deal with maybe the cool uh, as long as it's not wet either, right? If you combine cool and wet, I think that's that's the worst case scenario. So if we get back into close to to, to 50s and it's not too too wet, it's in, in a good moisture condition. I believe that 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 would help too. So I would say again wait until later in the in the in the, in the day today if you have to 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 go in. I agree with Manny and and what Jeff is saying as well, and especially when you look at Jeff's forecast a little bit about um, above normal precipitation in the near future. Mm -hmm. You know, I think because uh, we have seen that in Michigan in recent years, where the month of May is just when, right when we're in optimum time to plant, we don't have the conditions to plant, and so I think if you factor that in, this might be a might be a good time to to think about Manny's recommendations. So just get started a little bit and tomorrow will certainly be a really good day. We do have another another question um, from Scott Bales. It's what about emerged sugar beets? What's the scouting window for those uh, looking for um, frost freeze injury on emerged sugar beets? I don't know if we have anybody else on the call. I haven't done work on, on sugar beets, but I would say the, the window would be probably similar that it won't, you won't see, see the injury right away, right? You have to give it some time. So that three to five day window probably is a, is a good rule of thumb there too. And certainly the mid twenties are cold enough for some of those recently planted 
uh, mm -hmm. seedlings that did come up. Um, mid twenties is enough to uh, to cause some injury. So I, I think people are gonna have to have a have a close look. But uh, my my recollection is it's again it's a, it's that four to seven day time or three out out into the longer, longer part of a week to see what you've really got left. Or what's what the real problem is. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Mike, there's uh, one on seed treatment for early planted soybeans. Oh, okay, I missed that. And yeah, I think we can talk about that maybe, both you and I. And uh, Phil and I had a poll on, on, on seeding rate side of things. Phil, you want to maybe bring that poll up uh, while we're talking about, uh, about things? We, we just wanted to know what, what you guys are thinking about your seeding rates uh, going into, into this, this growing, growing season. We have two questions. Uh, the first question is, what will be the average soybean population you plan to plant for the 2021 growing season? And the second question is, what will the average corn population you plan to plant in 2021? Right. So I'll answer both those questions. And in a little bit, I'll, uh, I'll get some of the, I'll show the answers. Thanks, Phil. In terms of the seed treatment for early planted soybeans, we have done some, some work. Uh, the, the data I was showing you was across uh, uh, both uh, a complete seed treatment and untreated uh, soybeans. In our uh, work, we did see, I believe, a one out of four side yields, we saw improvement in plant stand uh, with, the, with the use of seed treatment, but it did not translate into, into an increased yield, as you can see from that uh, uh, pretty flat uh, response curve. But we, I believe uh, we were not dealing with the pest pressure you would, uh, ex where you would expect the seed treatment to, 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 to really show up. So to me, I think it's a more of a field specific question that we need to make sure that we have uh, the relative pest uh, present in, in that field uh, uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, we are going with a specific component of, of, of a seed treatment. And with early planting, uh, with the cool soils, a lot of those seedling diseases, uh, uh, a fungicide component probably is at least worth, worth the investment. Yes, I, I would agree with Nanny, and, and especially field specific. We've seen some fields, uh, one in Ionia County, one in uh, uh, St. Charles that had seed treatment, complete base seed treatments on them uh, for the last two or three years, and they were profitable each one of those years. But the bulk of our base seed treatment trials on soybeans really did not to generate that much income. It was kind of a break-even proposition. So not a lot of risk with the practice, um, but uh, not, not potentially a lot of gain across the average. I, although there is an exception to that, and that would be for sudden death syndrome. The two products, Olivo and Saltro, that uh, are in the marketplace are both very effective. In, in managing uh, or at least increasing yields under fields that are infested with sudden death syndrome. So I would encourage you to think about that if you're planting and that disease is known to be aggravated by early planting. So that's one that might, might pay. There is a new question. Uh, this is from actually more of a comment from Chris Stefanzo. Um, Some black cutworm and armyworm traps are live on the Great Lakes and Maritimes Pest Monitoring Network. If you plan to trap for these species, get traps up as soon as possible and start posting catches at least weekly. As of now, there's no black cutworm or, um, or the um, TAW catches in the Michigan traps at this point. So um, Eric is saying that he, now Eric's commenting and saying he doesn't have any black cutworms, but he does have three of... Uh, um, I should know what TAW is. True it's not a pest. Worm. Thank you. That's not right. a pest. I should have written it out. <laughs> okay. No, no problem. No problem. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, so is there any other questions? I see the poll results are done and they're very interesting. Manny, would you like to, to talk about those a little bit? Yeah, sure. Seems like majority of responses on the soybean side, uh, are between 100,000 and 120, and then 120 and then 140. So almost 70 percent is falling within within that that range. So so that's that's pretty good. Yeah, we our generic recommendation is to make sure that 
we have a hundred thousand plants uh, uh, in 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 the in the in the field, and it can be be, be lower. And it seems like there are few people who are pushing it lower than than hundred k, but still few folks who are still going above one forty. So there might be some potential again, you know, sequential decline. You know, put a strip in your field, uh, go with ten percent, fifteen percent lower than than what you have done. That's the goal in in soybeans is how low we can go. Uh, without cutting on the on the yield and maximizing profit, on the corn side, seems like uh, most of the responses are in that 30 to 34,000 uh, window, which again is pretty close to I think what uh, what the research data is is suggesting uh, uh, that 34, 32 to 34 uh, window is is, is optimal. And there have been the, the, the increase we are seeing o over the year in terms of pushing corn to a high seeding rate to get to high yield potential. The current research is showing that it's declining a little bit and that's because uh, a given plant is able to put more yield on it uh, uh, in terms of these new new hybrids. Uh, but again, the, the goal with corn is that how high we can push without again spending too much money on, on our seeding rates and this window seems uh, pretty pretty similar to what the research data is is showing so so thanks thanks everyone uh, for for sharing those uh, uh, those numbers yeah manny thanks for putting up the poll that's good information to capture i really appreciate it um, we've got a couple one more question uh, this is from ken like soybeans how important is it to plant corn seed at temperatures at 50 degrees or higher soil temperatures for how long to uptake the soil moisture? How many hours is the critical time? So, so I think for corn, the, the window that I have seen in literature uh, seems to be longer than 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 soybeans. So in soybeans, uh, we used to think 24 hours, but now there's even a, a thought process out there that the the imbibition hack occurs mostly in the in the first 12 hours. Uh, with with soybean uh, with corn, I believe the process is a bit slower. It might take 24 to to 48 hours, and the temperature threshold I think sticking closer to 50 might be a even more important or critical for corn because again remember we are looking for that even emergence and even plant stand much more so in in terms of corn than 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 soybean where the plant has the flexibility to to, to branch out and account for 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 some of the uneven and and low plant stands so in corn i believe we got to be more careful about sticking to this so sticking closer to this threshold of 50 degrees and probably at least for 24 if not uh, closer to 48 hours very good, Manny. Um, we had one last comment, and then I think that's all the questions. Uh, uh, Paul Gross is trapping moths up in central Michigan, and he says no moths of any type have been found in his traps. So uh, thank you, Paul. Manny, I really want to uh, congratulate you on an excellent presentation. Jeff, same to you. Really good presentations, a lot of good information that we can act on. Thank you very much for, for your time and effort today. With that, I think if there's no further questions, I think we're going to we're going to wrap this up then. And thanks for joining us.